This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to Crimes and Consequences. I hope everybody is doing amazing. Do we have any business to take care of? Yes, we do. What do we got today? We are having a feed drop. Oh, yeah, that's right. With the brand new podcast, The Devil Within. For those that don't know, a feed drop is where they drop a few minutes of their podcast into our feed. So it's going to look like we have an episode and I believe it's slated for June 8th, but it's not us. It's the devil within. It's about demonic possessions. Oh, so if you well, are goodness. interested in that supernatural kind of stuff, demonic possession. Wow. Anyway, are we done? We're done. So the story I have today on the gruesome scale, it's a 10. It's very graphic. And the details go on for quite a while. When I was writing this up, I actually questioned myself. Like, Talia, why are you reading this? And I have a feeling in 15 minutes, you guys are going to ask yourselves <laughs> oh, no. the same question. Why am I still listening? Oh, no. It's like a train wreck you can't turn away from. That being said, are you ready? Oh, I guess. Oh, it's bad. It's a recent case. In 2016... Blake Libel, he was 34 years old. He was living with his girlfriend, Iana Kazian, in a luxurious two-bedroom condo on Holloway Drive in West Hollywood. Iana was a lawyer and former prosecutor in Ukraine and had emigrated to the U.S. in 2014 to embark on a modeling career. And it was going well for her. The couple met in 2015 after Blake had just ended his five-year marriage to a model named Amanda Braun, with whom he shared two children. Blake was one of those guys who was very outgoing, and he could often be found mingling with the who's who of Hollywood. He was a son of a wealthy Canadian family, and when his mom died in 2011, he inherited almost $6 million dollars. It was paid out to him in installments of $1.8 million a year. He moved from Canada to the United States to pursue a career in screenwriting and comic book creations. I don't know much about comic books. I know your husband's a big fan. Yes. Apparently, there's a whole career in comic book creations. And it's a huge business. Some of his projects included producing a low-budget film called Bald. It was so low-budget, we've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Don't know it probably sucked. <laughs> and he contributed to the animated Spaceball series. There's an animated Spaceball series? Again, probably sucked. Yeah. But his biggest claim to fame was a graphic novel called Syndrome. Have you ever heard of Syndrome? No. Syndrome depicts the brutal murders of women in a comic book sort of setting. Oh, charming. Blake had past experience with comic series and was the creator overseer of the Syndrome Project. It was kind of like his baby. He came up with a storyline for it after studying serial killers for months. Now, the storyline of Syndrome consisted of a doctor named Wolf Chattel, who attempts to treat the most depraved type of killers, presenting the question of how one treats evil. The main character in the book is an actress named Karen Oates. She gets lured into this experiment to treat a serial killer, essentially being used as bait by the doctor to catch a killer. She ultimately becomes a killer's target, and he stabs her, and eventually he cuts off her head. Oh. The second page of this book depicts two victims being cut and hung upside down Their blood is draining as they watch each other slowly die. Oh, Lord. 
later the main character, Karen Oates, she is placed on a bed with her decapitated head beside her. The book cover depicts a picture of a baby doll with the top of the skull sliced off and a brain placed inside the skull. Jesus, this is heavy. So this kind of gives you a little hint as what's going on in Blake's mind. Syndrome was pre-released at a Comic-Con in San Diego in 2010 and then released all over the United States in comic book stores a few weeks later. You can still find it today. I was actually going to buy it for research on the story, but then I realized that he still gets earnings from it and I didn't want to give him any of my money. Too bad there's no library for checking out comic books, right? (laughs) I don't go to libraries anymore. (laughs) I don't think anyone does, unfortunately. Anyway, Blake was very proud of his creation. And as you'll soon find out, he used that story for inspiration in his own life. Now, in the fall of 2015, after only a few months of dating, Blake and Iana discovered that Iana was pregnant with his child. She moved into his two-bedroom condo on Holloway Drive. And in late April of 2016, as her due date approached, her mother, Olga, came from her home country, Ukraine, to help Iana with the birth of the baby. Iana rented an apartment for her mother not far from where she lived with Blake. And in early May... Iana delivered a healthy baby girl whom she named Diana. At first, the baby stayed with Iana and Blake at their West Hollywood condo. But within a couple days, Iana asked her mom if the baby could stay with her. The court records weren't clear as to why, and it has to be a really big deal for a woman who just gave birth to have a baby staying with anyone other than her. It's speculated that Blake began acting out towards Iana, jealous of the attention that she was giving baby Diana. Give me a break. And I believe he was also jealous of the relationship she had with her mother. Iana would come to her mother's house frequently. I mean, she spent most of her time there with the baby. When she returned to her own place, she kept in constant contact with her mom via cell phone. On May 23rd, A little over a week after Diana's birth, Iana and her mother went shopping together for a baby stroller. That would be the last time Olga would ever see her daughter alive. The next day, the two talked on the phone for seven minutes, which ended up being their final conversation. Surveillance video shows that Iana returned home to her condo at about 9.30 p.m. on the 24th and never left her condo again. Between May 25th and May 26th, Iana failed to respond to 75 text messages, 44 notifications, 100 calls, and 16 chats that were sent to her cell phone. 20 of those missed calls were from her mother, who was growing increasingly concerned for her daughter. Although Iana wasn't answering her phone, someone did use it on May 25th at 1.48 a.m. to order pizza online. Instructions were provided to the pizza delivery person to leave the food at the door after being buzzed in and to not ring the bell. At 2.11 a.m., a text from Iana's phone was sent to the delivery person, repeating the same request to make sure that the food is left at the door and to not ring their doorbell. The next day, at 3 a.m., more takeout was ordered online through Iana's phone on an app. The very next afternoon, at about 2 p.m., Olga couldn't take it anymore. Her gut said something was not right with her daughter. So she put the baby in her car with a friend, and they drove over to Iana and Blake's condo to check on her. The complex that the couple lived in, it had underground parking. So I'm going to try to describe it for you. If you were standing on the road and you faced the condo, you would see a spot to drive under the condo to park. So the very first level isn't even with the ground. 
It's higher up. So there's a balcony on the first floor. Okay? Okay. Olga and her friend checked the parking structure and noted that Iana's car was parked in its normal spot in the garage. Olga walked around to the front of Blake and Iana's condo. And seeing that the sliding glass door on the balcony was open, she called out, Blake, open the door for me. She could see Blake's silhouette and hand as he slid the glass door shut, completely disregarding Olga's request. Oh, this doesn't sound good. Fearing for her daughter, Olga had that mother instinct. She was so concerned that she called the L.A. Police Department to do a welfare check. Within minutes, two deputies arrived to help Olga. When they got to the condo, the blinds on the balcony window were closed, so they couldn't see anything inside the apartment. One deputy knocked on the door and then rang the doorbell several times. We got no response. Neither officer heard anything or saw anything from the inside that would lead them to believe someone was there. But they did take Olga's concerns very seriously. After obtaining Blake's cell phone number from the property manager, and I don't know why Olga didn't have it, but she didn't, they got the number from the property manager. Both deputies placed calls to him. One was at 4.20 p.m. and the other was at 4.45 p.m. They left voicemails saying they really needed to talk to him. It was urgent. And then they left numbers for him to call them back. But, of course, Blake didn't call them back. With no legal justification to enter the apartment, the deputies had no choice but to leave. But they had spent two hours there, which I was pretty impressed with. That's a lot. Later on that day, Olga called texted, and left several more messages, all of which were unanswered by Iana. She was leaving them in the middle of the night. One was at 3 a.m., and in Russian, she wrote, Blake, answer me. And then another text said, Are you alive, my dear daughter? I called the police because I know he's holding you there against your will. I came over there and I knocked. Please answer me. I'm only speculating, but I believe Iana shared with Olga some secrets all about what was going on in that condo in the past month since she arrived, which would lead her to have this heightened sense of dread. The next morning, Olga had enough. She was not going to end that day without finding out what was going on with her daughter. She returned to the Holloway Drive condo, leaving the baby in the care of a friend, After knocking on the door and getting no answer, she just called 911. By then, it had been three days since she'd seen her daughter and two days since she'd spoken with her. One deputy, his name was Deputy Johnson, he got dispatched to take the call. After arriving to the West Hollywood home, he met with Olga and she brought him up to date on the situation. He spoke to a neighbor in the hallway who told him that he hadn't seen anyone leaving or entering the condo in at least two days. Deputy Johnson knocked on the door, but again, he got no answer. At 8.44 a.m., he called Blake's cell phone, and he left a voicemail telling him that he just wanted to know if Iana was okay and to give her a message that she needs to call her mom or the sheriff's department as soon as possible. As time went on, The deputy stayed there at the condo. After speaking with the condo manager and explaining the situation, Deputy Johnson obtained a key to the condo and he waited for backup to arrive. And I'm pretty sure after they entered the condo, all of these deputies needed therapy. Oh, no. It's so, so, so bad. I'm going to need therapy after this episode. And it just goes on and on. But we'll get there. I'm jumping ahead. After more deputies showed up, Deputy Johnson used the key to unlock the front door. But the safety latch was engaged, so it wouldn't open. Not sure what to do, the cops consulted with their sergeant, and after he reviewed the situation, 
He determined that exigent circumstances existed, allowing authorities to kick in the door. Without a warrant. Without a warrant. The deputies entered the unit and they found no one in the living room, no one in the dining room, no one in the kitchen, no one on the balcony. The condo was completely dark. And in order to get to the rest of it, the bedrooms basically, you had to go down a hallway, but there was a door to the hallway. And when they went to open it, it was locked. The deputies broke that door down, but a mattress was barricading behind it, once again, preventing them from getting in. But one deputy managed to squeeze through the door into the hallway. And then he removed the barricading mattress, allowing the other officers to follow him. They first checked the guest bedroom, and there's a bathroom in that guest bedroom. But there were no signs of Blake or Iana. However, they did observe blood on the headboard of the guest room's bed. The only room left to search was the master bedroom. But once again, that door was locked. After announcing their presence... The deputies kicked in the door and found another mattress barricading that door from the inside. The deputies called out, come out. If there's anyone inside, just come out. A male voice from inside the master bedroom responded saying that he was not going to come out because he was afraid that they would beat him up. And they should have. (laughs) He, trust me, deserves his ass kicked. A deputy yelled out that they were just there to check on his girlfriend and asked him if he knew where she might be. He said that she was all right. She was fine, not to worry, but she'd been admitted into the Cedar sinai Hospital. He even gave the room number where she was supposed to be staying in. But of course, after calling the hospital, they found out he was full of shit and ordered him to get the hell out of the bedroom. Blake responded by telling them that his father would soon be there, and once his father arrived, he would come out without incident. Now, the man Blake referred to as his father wasn't his dad. He was a man named Stephen Green. Stephen was Blake's accountant. What? (laughs) No, I'm like... And mentor. He was a father figure to Blake. I don't know how you go from an accountant to, like, a father figure, but whatever. He's got a lot of money, spent a lot of time with a guy, probably. Probably. Blake had called Stephen a few minutes earlier, asking him to come on over to his place. The two had been close for years, but over the past four weeks, Blake hadn't been returning Stephen's calls, which was really unusual because they spoke almost every day. In fact, on May 23rd, just a few days earlier... Stephen left Blake a voicemail saying that he was really worried about him, that he loved him, and he wanted to help him with whatever was going on. And when I tell you what's going on, you realize there's no way Stephen could have helped him. Not an accountant, at least. No, no. Need a trained professional for this. Shortly thereafter, Stephen did arrive on the scene. And police allowed him into the hallway, and he spoke... To Blake through the partially open bedroom door. But Blake, not a man of his word, wouldn't leave the bedroom. From the condo's living room, Stephen sat on the couch and he called Blake. And he once again tried to convince him to just leave the bedroom. So obviously more time is passing. That's why Stephen sat down. But once again, Blake refused. I'm surprised the police just haven't barged in and got him. Maybe they're afraid he's armed. Yeah, and they still don't really know what happened. Yeah. By this point, authorities are desperate to get the son of a bitch out of that bedroom because they don't know what's going on with Iana in there. A detective grabbed Stephen's phone and he spoke with Blake. Somehow, after a few minutes, he convinced Blake to come out. Blake removed the mattress, blocking the door, and he exited the master bedroom wearing only his boxer shorts. He appeared to be clean, as if he recently showered. Now, Blake is very tall. He's six foot three. He weighed 210 pounds, and he wore glasses. As he walked out, police observed bruising to both of his eyes that extended across the bridge of his nose 
consistent with someone who wore glasses getting punched in the face or hit with some blunt force trauma to the face. He also had some linear scratches under his left eye, a long linear red scratch on his chest, and a diagonal scratch along the left side of his face. He had scratches and punctures consistent with someone with nails just digging in. He also had a human bite mark on his right bicep. The bite mark appeared to have been made as he came around behind someone so that his right bicep was against their mouth. There was bruising on the front shin of both legs and at the base of his knee. He had bruises around his foot and his ankle. But none of these injuries could even compare to what I'm about to describe in just a few minutes. But clearly, Iana put up a fight. As the deputies entered the master bedroom, one of them screamed, she's on the bed. Everyone inside the apartment, including Olga and Steve, were ordered immediately outside. And two paramedics who'd been waiting in an ambulance at the parking lot of the complex, they were allowed to enter the condo and they pronounced Iana dead at 1.02 p.m. Iana's naked body was laying on a clean sheet on the bed and was covered by a Mickey Mouse blanket that was placed over a blue polka dotted blanket. Her head was on the pillow, but to the shock of investigators, most of her scalp and face were missing. What? Missing. Like, Not there. Like her skin and her muscles? Yes. Oh my and God. And I'm going to go into graphic detail. It's the worst scalping probably in the history of the United States. Oh my God. But before I do that, let's take a break. I left off telling you that Yana was found laying on the bed. There was a pillow next to her on her left, and there was an indentation in it indicating that Blake had been laying next to Iana's disfigured dead body. When investigators removed the clean sheets her body was laying on, they discovered that the mattress below it was stained with dried blood. Obviously, Blake was immediately placed under arrest and taken to the L.A. County Jail. Leaving detectives and crime scene investigators to examine a very brutal, graphic, and barbaric crime. Are you ready? Yeah. You've been warned. (laughs) And you can't leave, Tanya. You have to stay put. (laughs) Bloodstains and human flesh were found behind one of the beds and on the wall near where Iana's head had been. A portion of one of her eyebrows was laying on the rug on the floor. Her eyebrow? Her eyebrow. Okay, I gotta buckle up. The master bedroom had its own bathroom. Investigators could hear the sound of running water coming from that bathroom. When they entered it, they saw warm water was flowing out of the tub's faucet. Blood and hair were floating in the water that had collected inside the tub because the drain was clogged with tissue and other matter. In the bathroom's trash can lay a clump of Iana's hair that Blake had thrown away, along with a blood-stained razor. The bathroom sink had blood smeared all over it. A green paring knife, similar to others found in the couple's kitchen, was found in the top drawer in the bathroom cabinet with blood where the handle met the blade. Now the mattress that had been blocking the hallway door, that belonged to the bed in the guest bedroom. And this is a little strange. Even though there's only two bedrooms in this condo, there were three beds. The master bedroom itself had two beds, which is odd, right? Yes, that's kind of strange. Who was sleeping on the second bed? I don't know, but 
To go over the mattresses so everybody can understand, the guest bedroom's mattress was blocking the hallway door. There was a mattress in the master bedroom that was on the bed, and then there was a second mattress blocking that door. All of them had blood on them. Oh. So you're thinking to yourself, Talia, this sounds like a bloody crime scene, but we've talked about them before. Does you wait? The guest bed on the headboard, there were multiple blood stains that were oval shaped. They had been made from the top of Iana's scalped head as she ride around. Her head's hitting the headboard. Moving around the headboard. Moving around the headboard. Okay. Missing her scalp. scalp. There was also blood on two towels, a pillowcase, the hardwood floors, the base of the drapes of the guest bedroom. Basically blood everywhere. In addition, the drain in the tub of the guest bedroom had blood and freshly cut hair in it. So this is two bathtubs filled with tissue, blood, and hair. Iana's tissue and blood were located on the wall behind the toilet in the second bedroom and on the cabinet there. Chemical testing in the dining room and the hall confirmed that Blake had tried to clean up the blood in that area because there was solvent there and diluted blood. When police examined the kitchen, they discovered traces of Iana in the garbage disposal. Oh my God. In the dumpster under the trash chute located in the hallway, about 20 feet from the unit, detectives discovered bloodstained bedding, towels, clothing, bath mats, placemats. Placemats? Placemats. I didn't even know I wrote that. (laughs) Placemats. A bed skirt with bloody handprints. Human tissue, including some pieces with hair that appeared to be a scalp. And one of Iana's ears. My God, there's like stuff everywhere. All over this place. Jesus Christ. I've just started. Oh my God. Do you want to hear the results of her autopsy? Yes, you do. Yes, Yes, you do. Of course you do. Come on. An autopsy was performed by Dr. Reib, the medical examiner for LA County. The results indicated that at the time of her death, Iana was 30 years old, 5 foot 4 inches tall, and weighed 152 pounds. She had only been dead maybe 12 hours before she was found, which meant that she'd been held hostage and tortured for at least an entire day. The cruelty I'm about to describe can only be inflicted by a monster. According to the medical examiner, Iana not only survived the inflictions, but remained conscious until the last few minutes of her life. She was conscious? For hours. Oh, my God. And this is what happened to her while she remained conscious. Her entire scalp had been removed from the eyebrows almost to the hairline at the very back of her head. A large portion of skin on the right side of her face was also removed. Skull bone was visible. All the tissue over the top of her head had been taken off. There were cuts across the lower forehead, below the eyebrows, on the right side from the cheek to the jawline, and on the left side toward the ear, which was missing. Her face had been skinned. Oh my God. And then the tissue removed. A bladed instrument had been used to remove the skin, but to remove the tissue in the face... The medical examiner determined that was done manually with Blake using his fingers. What? To rip them off. What? Yes. Rip the muscles in her face off? Yes, with his fingers. Oh my God. What kind of fucking monster is this? I told you. Oh my God. Her DNA was found under his fingernails. Oh my God. This poor woman. I know. Based on the amount of injury... Tiana's face and skull, the difficulty involved with the combination of cutting and tearing, in the medical examiner's opinion, that would have taken a substantial period of time to inflict. There were quite a number of bruises and abrasions on her face, primarily to the left side, the left cheek, 
in the left jaw. And there was a human bite mark on her left jaw. Pieces of the scalp, the right ear, an eyebrow, and other soft tissue collected from the crime scene showed hemorrhaging, which is consistent with Iana being alive at the time they were cut from her body. That's how they know she was alive. In addition, inflammation of the injured tissue was present. And that doesn't occur for at least six hours after an injury. And that's only if the body is alive and pumping blood. Oh, my God. I know I keep saying it, but wow. That poor woman. Dr. Rib concluded that Iana was alive for at least eight hours after part of her face and scalp were ripped off her, leaving her bones exposed. He said, quote, I've never seen this before, and I doubt if hardly any forensic pathologist in this country or abroad have seen this outside of perhaps wartime. It's so extremely rare. End quote. (laughs) Oh, my God. Tanya only laughs when she's very nervous or uncomfortable because you just laughed after I just told you the craziest thing. (laughs) Oh, my God. (sighs) I told you it was so bad. This one's bad. Yeah, this one's really bad. But I'm not done. Oh, my God. No, Talia, there's more. Oh, yeah, there's more. What? I'm only half done with the graphic, (laughs) gruesome torture. Oh, my God, this woman. This woman suffered so much. I told you all, you're going to be like, why am I still listening? (laughs) I have to, though. You guys want to keep listening because I'm not done. Oh. Are you ready for me to continue? Yes, I'm ready. The cause of death was ruled to be blood loss due to head trauma. The trauma cut several arteries and veins. Okay, so you hear, oh, blood loss, veins, arteries cut. Couldn't have taken that long. But that's not the full story. Blood loss is fatal when half of the body's original blood volume is missing. Iana was missing more than half of her blood volume. Did you know that it's not possible to completely drain a human of all their blood? No, I didn't know that. I did not know that, but that's what this doctor testified to. And you're going to learn a lot about bloodletting in just a minute. You can thank me later for that. (laughs) Oh, no. Because this is where it gets even crazier. As if everything I described wasn't barbaric enough. The absence of so much blood in Iana's body was extremely unusual, even in light of her injuries. In order for such a high level of bloodletting to occur, which is also known as exsanguination, the heart has to be pumping blood. Gravity alone wouldn't be sufficient. So if you killed somebody and you hung them upside down and you sliced everything up and you wanted to bleed them out, you wouldn't be able to get half their blood out. You have to have a heart pumping. And now you're going to tell me how she ended up with less than half? Yes, I am. (sighs) no. So in order to accomplish the amount of blood loss that Iana had, she would have had to have been placed in a bathtub with her head lower than her feet, so upside down. But even that isn't enough because eventually your body will start the healing process and the blood will coagulate. So how does one prevent coagulation? By running warm water over a wound that continuously causes... It to bleed. To bleed. Oh, because it's not healing. Exactly. It's washing away the clotting. The water would have washed away the blood from the wounds, increasing blood flow, and hindering the formation of any type of blood clotting in the injured areas. So what that means is Blake intentionally held Liana's face and head under flowing warm water with her legs in the air for a very long time. Oh, my God. Based on the crime scene analysis, he held her scalp body in the tub of the guest bedroom. Then he moved her, while still alive, to the mattress. Then he moved her to the master bedroom and put her on the bed. And then he... While still alive, moved her to the master bedroom's tub and repeated the process from earlier. Who knows 
knows to do this. He studied it. His book. Oh my oh god, that's right. He studied this. That's right. Oh my god. That's why I talked about his book. Oh. Fuck. The medical examiner believes this process lasted for six to eight hours. Oh, I can't believe this. Until eventually the loss of blood reached a level where she became unconscious and died. Finally. Based on the wrinkling of the pads of Iana's fingers, the absence of blood, and the presence of clear fluid in her vagina, plus the presence of foam in her nostrils, they believe that after her death, she was submerged in the bathtub in water for at least 30 minutes. Hmm. He was trying to clean her body, Mm -hmm. which is why her body was found on clean sheets. Mm -hmm. Clean. Wow. Defensive wounds were observed on Iana's right arm and both of her hands. There were bruises on the back of her left hand and wrists consistent with her having struggled, blocked, or fought back. There were abrasions and bruising on the left side of her face that was consistent with being punched really hard. There were bruises on her neck, on her left upper arm, left wrist, her hand. They could see markings on her arm that looked like fingerprint bruising from being grabbed really hard. And I mentioned earlier that she had a bite mark on her jaw. She also had a bite mark on her left bicep. The amount of pain and suffering Iana experienced in the last day of her life is beyond anything we could ever comprehend. And that's basically what the medical examiner said. To lose one's face and scalp in such a prolonged attack is just unimaginable, especially when it's being done by the father of your child. Prior to the commencement of his trial, a medical health evaluation was done on Blake, and he was deemed to be sane. Wow. He's just a sick asshole. He is just a sick asshole. I don't have any idea why he did it, because... He never said? He never said. His trial... For the torture and first degree murder of Iana Cassian began in June of 2018. Now, at this trial, an expert testified. His name was Dr. Michael Habib. He testified for the prosecution and he testified as an expert in human cadaveric anatomy and fluid biomechanics, including blood flow in the human body. Wow, really? Wow. Is he yes. a medical? He's a medical doctor. Yes, he's yes. a medical doctor. Dr. Habib reviewed the autopsy report and photographs and the crime scene photographs and medical literature involving scalping. He was an expert in scalping. Hmm. Interestingly, he stated to the court that even in cases of complete scalping, and so you know, Giannis was only 80%. It wasn't a complete scalping. There was a little bit, of, I believe, a little bit left on her left side of the face. Victims were not usually in immediate danger of dying. Although the scalping would be painful and traumatic, it doesn't ordinarily lead to an enormous amount of blood loss. In fact, he could find no cases in the literature of death by scalping alone. Most of the patients in the medical books were able to get themselves to the hospital. The only real way to die from scalping is by getting an infection that would occur later on. But you wouldn't bleed to death. Wow. He opined that the injuries suffered by Iana, the removal of 80% of her scalp, would have been excruciatingly painful, and judging from the different sorts of cuts, torn edges, her scalp was removed not at once, but by numerous cuts and tears over a lengthy period of time. I mentioned earlier, the initial injuries were the result of a sharp instrument to the scalp, and then fingers were used to remove the remaining parts underneath the skin. The deeper wounds that damaged the vessels would have caused the most blood loss, and they were torn. They were very ragged and uneven with variable depths, and he testified it was consistent with the work of a person untrained in dissection and anatomy. (laughs) Wow. Now, Dr. Habib had a very strange job. He spent over a year and a half studying donated cadavers to determine whether it was possible to exsanguinate someone to the extent seen in this case. He tried to replicate what happened to Iana. 
He and his team used external pumps to mimic the heart. They connected these pumps somehow to the cadavers. He then made cuts to the carotid and femoral arteries to make them bleed. He selected 14 different vessels with multiple depths and sizes. He found the most exsanguinated cadavers still had blood in 12 of the 14 vessels. Iona had no blood in any of the vessels, any of the arteries, and not in her heart. So he couldn't even replicate it. He could never replicate it. Every single cadaver Dr. Habib studied had blood still remaining in their hearts. Even using a state-of-the-art laboratory and external pumps, he never came close to the exsanguination that occurred to Iana's body. He said that in order to make that happen, as we already know, her face, upper neck, and head had to be the lowest points of her body. She had to have been inverted in the bathtub with the water running over her head for at least an hour, but probably more. Dr. Habib testified that Iana was most likely conscious but somehow made immobile during the exsanguination process. A blood spatter specialist testified at the trial and said that Iana was attacked while laying on the master bed. It's clear she was dragged all over the apartment after the initial attack. And basically everything else I already told you, so I'm not going to go over it. In June of 2018, Blake was convicted of first-degree murder with supplemental charges of torture and mayhem. He wasn't given death. What? He was not given death. He was given a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving his sentence at one of California's lovely correctional (laughs) institutions. He's only 40, so he's got a long ways to go. In 2019, Iana's family, including Olga, sued Blake in a bench trial for the wrongful death of Iana. The judge ruled in their favor, and they were awarded $42 million. Now, because Blake was wealthy, Iana's mother actually got some of the money, and she's using that to raise baby Diana, whom she has custody of. Olga moved back to Ukraine, where she now lives with her granddaughter and is probably dreading the day when little Diana asks about what happened to her parents, because Diana is five now. And that is the horrific story of the death of Iana Cassian. I am, wow. I wonder what set him off. Like, were they arguing? Were they going to break up? Was she going to leave? He attacked her face. And, right. Like, that's really all he yeah. attacked on her. So he really had a lot of rage inside of him. That lasted for days. I think it's telling when you hear that his father figure noticed something different happening in the last month. Right. And that's also the same time that Olga moved to be with her daughter, and also the birth of his child with her. Something snapped. Damn. But he'd probably been thinking about it for a long Mm -hmm. time. You don't fucking just get mad at your girlfriend and do that. No. Wow. Damn. That's a fucked up one. Yeah, it is. I want to thank all of you that are still listening. (laughs) I got my information from the court record, so I know it's accurate. Also, one article on the website, allthatsinteresting.com. If you haven't done so already, we would love for you to hit the subscribe slash follow button so you can get notifications every week of our newest releases. We also have a members only group where we have almost, we're approaching 70 episodes that are only for our members. You can help support us and get ad-free early releases, full episodes, mini episodes, live episodes, just go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, or you can go to our website, tntcrimes.com, to find out more. We also have pictures on this case on that website. If you're using an app and you see that there are numbers missing in the episode list, those are now online only 
episodes that you can listen to for free. We're also on the social media, IG, Facebook, at Hardcore True Crime. Anything else? No, you covered it. What about some shout outs? Sure. Do you want to have the honor? Absolutely. We would like to thank our newest members, Christina, Linda, Missy, Dory, Ramona, Ashley, Renetta, Lorena, Dally Wally, Lisa, Jennifer, Star, and Maria. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. We hope you're enjoying the perks of being a member. I'm sure they are. <laughs> Dive right in. But warning, if you don't like the word fuck <laughs> and really graphic true crime stories. As if this one wasn't graphic enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. I was going to say, then don't be a member. But if you do like the word fuck. <laughs> <laughs> if you do like the word fuck. <laughs> then become a member. And I'll say it just for them. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'll give a lot of fucks. <laughs> Anyway, I want to thank you guys all really from the bottom and top of our hearts. Don't forget June 8th, you're going to get this notification. That there's a new episode. It's not. But if you like demonic possession, you'll want to listen. So check it out. Anything else, Tanya? No. All right. Do not kill each other <laughs> until our while next, we're gone. Yeah, until our next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye.